Okay, so hi everyone. I think some of my ideas are slightly less well formed than we've heard yeah. already today. So just bear with me as I go through. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some aspects of my research which focuses on rethinking henge monuments, looking beyond the current form of archaeological site types and classifications, and thinking about henges as they were created, understood and used through time. In this paper, I'll be focusing on one of the main aspects of henge research, the definition on continuous reclassification attempts since 1932, and how that has affected the understanding and recording of possible henge sites now. I'll also go over some of my initial thoughts about the way forward towards a better understanding of these sites and whether current calls for a total abandonment of the terminology is a useful one by investigating if a relational typology approach supports the notion of a site type. Although as of yet I have no final conclusions, I hope that I can highlight some of my thoughts on the matter as I continue to work through the data and hopefully may prompt some, some questions for the discussion later on in the afternoon as to whether this approach is a useful one at all. So when we think of henge monuments, this is often one of the ones that springs to mind, as we've just seen today. Um, one of the largest, one of the larger henge enclosures of Wessex, here is Avebury, which now surrounds the village. Um, nearby is Marden, Durrington Walls, Mount Pleasant, and of course Stonehenge, the probably most famous. Um, these have received a lot of attention and archaeological focus, unsurprisingly considering their size, preservation, and their concentration in the landscape. This has resulted in many publications and continued focus on this small region of the British Isles. But yet if we think about some of the smaller sites, such as those in Scotland, we can see similarity in the layout and sometimes in the internal settings of stones or other features, but the size is vastly different. The construction, in terms of effect, number of people involved and time taken, would differ dramatically. The scale of activity within the interior and the number of people who could enter any one time would also differ. Yet these sites are listed in the same site type terminology of henge. <coughs> so this slide illustrates the ground plans of a number of henge monuments, excluding the larger Wessex henges, because obviously they just drown the entire slide, um, showing the typical characteristic circular bank and ditch with one or two entrances. However, you can see the variety in size, layout and orientation in this small sample of sites. If sites which are generally considered to be found within the henge category vary this much, then as we move on to possible sites or next converted crop maps, it is easy to see how the number of sites listed as a henge or henge related has grown, and with it an increase in variation based on form alone. So since the term was first coined in 1932, the definition of henge monuments and the number of sites listed under the term has been revised, rewritten, extended and broken down numerous times. This has resulted in a number of terms being introduced to further divide the growing corpus into subtypes or classes of henge monuments. This slide shows some of the publications and the related terms which have served to expand the classification and increase the number of sites considered to belong to this general site type. The earlier publications tended to sort sites based on form, focusing on number of entrances, banks and ditches, a trend which continued through to publication in the 90s and created terms which are still widely used today, class 1 and class 2. Terms such as henge form and mini henge were introduced for sites which shared morphological similarities but where the size was considerably smaller than those considered classic henges. At the other extreme, henge enclosure and more recently superhenge referred to the Wessex sites, whose size set them apart from the rest of the group. Formative henge is another term used to describe some henge form monuments or atypical form styles that are also often of an early date. Such expansions has resulted in the list of sites included with each of these publications growing in number. It has also created a number of classes with varying definitions that have allowed a number of sites with vague similarities to classic henges being added to the ever-growing corpus. So Alex Gibson has recently readdressed this issue, questioning the focus on morphological similarities at sites which lack archaeological investigation. He argues that the simple classification systems highlighted in the previous slides often ignore variety in layout. For example, air through its four entrances is often still discussed in terms of a classic henge and therefore with one and two entrance sites by some authors. Terms such as henge form have meant that the restrictions which originally formed the definition of this site type have effectively collapsed, meaning that a large number of sites with relatively similar characteristic, characteristics such as a near circular or oval layout were added to the henge class. And on looking through HER descriptions, henge form is one of the most used terms after henge itself. 
Now the problems with using site types are well known. They do not account for regional patterns, changes in use or design, or effectively any choice on behalf of the builders. They suggest a specified idealised ground plan for a type of monument. So the collapse of the concrete type is not necessarily surprising. However, as the number of sites within the henge category, category grew, the separation between henges and other circular monuments became severely blurred. Considering stone circles, tim circles and henge monuments, both Richard Bradley and Alex Gibson have summarised the similarities and interchangeability of these monuments and argue for them not to be considered in isolation, with there being no reason to see them as separate types. Gibson suggests that the terminology related to henge monuments ultimately affects our treatment of them as a separate and specific site type, and advocates instead for the abandonment of the term henge and the move towards seeing them as another recreation of circular forming earth, earth circles. But is earth circles alongside stone circles and timber circles any use? Is earth circles not itself reductive, moving away from ideas of use, of significance, and instead having purely morphological or, or architectural connotations? Will it not become confused and extended still? Wouldn't some barrows and enclosed cremation cemeteries alongside other circular sites become, be li become listed under the same term? The creation of circular space and the use of materials to create zoned areas is a pattern which is clearly significant and a subject which is worth focusing on. But there are many differences between the uses of sites, the properties, the effects and the symbolism of different materials, and yet we also need to recognise that there was diversity in the past. The blurring of site types into general patterns is therefore in some sense a useful step, but we still need to come to terms with the vocabulary we use. So how do we reassess these sites? And does a new approach typology support Henge as a site type? Over 780 sites have been listed as Henge monuments at some point in their investigative history. Many sites are often subsequently reclassified, including examples of mills and 21st century sites that have been forgotten. A large proportion have not received archaeological investigation, and few sites have been fully or extensively excavated, due to the assumed significance of a henge site, or scheduling as important sites for preservation for the future. So considering the limited number of fully excavated sites, it is clear that our understanding of henge monuments is constricted by the information gathered from archaeological investigation at a small percentage of sites or the tendency for some archaeologists to label sites based on minimal morphological similarities. Most literature tends to focus on sites deemed classic henge monuments, or on well-known example sites such as those in, Wessex, in the Wessex region or Orkney, or even more recently Yorkshire. Perhaps a relational approach can start to aggress some of the shortcomings of a traditional typological system. A type seen through an assemblage approach would be a series of things which were repeatedly pre reproduced in a reiteration of a past event from memory, from knowledge, each in a new assemblage but is related to others through similar constitutive relations upon which Chris outlined earlier today. Using this approach, types can occur at varying topographic scales. Strong types could be apparent in the emergence of sites with a detailed understanding of the location, chronology, use and underlying relations shedding light on this. For example, the repeated form of the Yorkshire hinges with their multiple banks and ditches, extremely similar size and orientation, could be evidence of this at a regional level. Morphology, materials, chronology, sequence and experience, these are all important aspects of monument creation and use. The almost absolute focus on physical form of henge sites has led to the disagreement, discussion and disdain for traditional typology and the term terminology of old site types. So I want to see if we can put this relational approach into practice with my data set of Henge and Henge Farm monuments across the British Isles. Will this highlight patterning which could confirm something distinctive to suggest a site type? Will there be any strong patterning at all? Or are we looking at a circular architecture which is on a spectrum alongside stone and timber circles? So using HGR and NMR databases alongside the known literature on Henge monuments, I collected a list of sites which were termed Henge or Henge Farm in their investigation history. Out of the 708 sites which were collected during this process, mm -hmm. many have since been reclassified due to subsequent excavation or investigation and have since been revealed to be other site types, including curses, monuments, quarries, mills, later enclosures, natural fe features, even the remains of a World War II gun emplacement. And many of the remaining number are references to uncertain circular crop mark sites listed as a possible henge monument amongst a number of other site types. So out of this large corpus, 352 provided enough information to be included in analysis within a relational database. Of these, less than half have seen excavation. 
163 sites to be exact, 45.7%. And so some of the features and measurements are limited to ground investigations and interpretations prior to excavation. The majority of sites, unsurprisingly, fit within variations of the one ditch, one bank basic form or one ditch, no bank, whilst others fit within Irish henge or embanked enclosure, one bank pattern. However, there are 33 different flat form types within this sample of sites returned when queried on the database. Um, and by flat form types, I mean a traditional morphological base definition or grouping alone. So just to explain a little further on that, one of the main flaws of using a traditional typology is that the effect has been of flattening sites. It makes them appear as a specific type of site only when the physical characteristics fit those which are listed in the description. This ultimately means that sites are not hinges until they are finished, but this language is based on our concept of architecture and construction. This has the effect of flattening a long period of construction, use, abandonment, revisiting and any alterations into a single term, therefore creating the false definition of a site based upon one snapshot. snapshot. These two Scottish examples illustrate the point well. Bremend is associated with a number <coughs> of monumental constructions and developed over time as part of a monument complex. The Henge was not just construction finished, and it was a later phase of alteration at an already significant monumental site. Similarly, Poly here, I think it says, um, here was altered at a later stage with internal features and the banks raised at specific points. The relationship between these sites, monument complexes, architectural alterations and changing generations is also part of the monument and needs to be considered when looking for a type of site and for a classification system that fits. So, but for now, back to some of my results. One of the flat forms with the largest number of sites is the One Ditch One Bank group. This returned 170 sites, 150 of which had an external bank. Taking a close look at the sites which fall into this group, we can see that those which have one entrance and are therefore by default class one henges, if we use the traditional terminology, have a high percentage of excavation. And again, similarly for those with two entrances, which are typically termed class two henges. Whilst the two Wessex sites which make up the one ditch, one bank and four entrance group have both been excavated. These numbers highlight the high percentage of excavated sites within groups fitting typical classification definitions and a probable excavation bias. However, this is an unsurprising figure given the definition of henges throughout the previous literature. And these groupings are perhaps where we can delve further to see if there is a strong patterning across sites within the traditional form-based classifications due to their high levels of archaeological investigation and therefore details on features, sequence and dating. So looking at a smaller group, the 72 sites which are one ditch, one bank sites with one entrance and an external bank. Um, if we look at the internal features recorded at those sites, 30% of those sites had individual pits, 11 had barrow mounds, 13% had pit circles, 11% had stone circles and other features ranged between 0 and 10%, 11%. None of these queries returned overwhelmingly large numbers and pits appear to be the type of feature most common to all form groups. I've also gone further to look into the relationship between human remains and features and banks and ditches as well, but I haven't filled this in here. Um, so I'm also currently summing up the, summing up the ditch width to diam diameter ratio to see if there is some cohesion in sites and design between sites. We see that for one ditch, one bank, one entrance, external bank sites, the measurements suggest um, a middle range of one to one to seven in terms of the ratio, and whilst the most often um, returned result is one to five, which suggests a broad ditch to back, broad ditch to interior range. However, there is a large range within this data from one to two to one to thirty-four. So, how can we further test the strength of patterns or the lack of patterning? We can investigate landscape location and evidence for site use, sequences of activity and dating, and the use of our artefacts in relation to feature types. We can focus on regions or time frames, or investigate other patterns suggested by authors, such as the relationship between hinges and water. <coughs> and we can layer these as well. So following Fowler, where are all specific hinges, for example, those listed above, made in a similar event? And if not, what does that say? about either this approach or the typology currently in play for class, hen class 2 and class 1 henges. For this we really need to get to groups with sequence and dating evidence. <coughs> Perhaps however, 
that relation typology is not the most useful approach to answer such questions. Perhaps the overall variation when dating and sequence information is also looked into will go on to argue against a strong type. <coughs> and perhaps a site-based approach is more useful. Barrett, Colin Richards and more re most recently Rick Younger have all, suge all suggested biographical approaches to understanding these sites as places within the landscape over time. By thinking about the creation process in particular, we can begin to think about the significance of these sites as a large-scale physical event, changing the landscape and enclosing and defining a space. We can also begin to think about individual elements or structures within the life history of a monument, the development of meaning and the social practices which led to the incorporation of such elements. This view links into a better understanding of small henge sites, some of which seem to have had no subsequent use, highlighting again that the idea of a flat, finished and usable henge is extremely misleading. And what about another option? Extracting the earthwork as an architectural feature, which is found at a number of circular sites used to exaggerate or enclose a significant area. But do we have to choose either typology or biography? Can we work with both and what do we gain if we do? Can we think in terms of types of site biography? Can we build life histories? Although I've only briefly highlighted some of my typological tests on my data set, I hope I have shown some of the thoughts I'm currently working through whilst interrogating the data, and hopefully at some point soon I can return with a finished argument and conclusion. And that's where I'll end it. <laughs>